Shall we begin? Shall we try? Sure. Um, first of all, I'm, uh, I represent, uh, I hope, the, the largest so far uh, men's rights movement site, masculis.ru, in Russia. Uh, myself, I'm uh, just a divorced father who was angry enough to write uh, an own book about men's rights and so on mostly about uh, based on Anglosphere and English books about the subject, uh, Warren Farrell and so on. Right. Uh, during, during my research uh, on, after reading the book by uh, Alec Baldwin, uh, I researched a bit uh, the internet for uh, anything related to Richard Gardner. And that's how I came to your channel with his interview oh. and later found your interview and this interview, from your permission, was translated, and uh, our audience already have seen it uh, many times. Me, myself, I've seen it personally uh, I, I, countless times. I still watch it from time to time. I use it as a personal, uh, I don't know, as <laughs> a small therapy <laughs> session sometimes. Like, the story is about uh, an, an old man and his briefcase, and yeah, it's touched me very oh. deeply and resonated oh. a lot. Yeah. Uh, so my first question will be: uh, Do you still do what what you described in your interview? And what was this interview for? Was it ever aired, and so on? Well, I, I'm st I still am uh, in the office uh, every day. I'm still practicing full time with with difficult cases. The the majority are for fathers. Once in a rare while, I I act for a mother who's controlling ex-husband uh, has sort of psychologically kidnapped the kids. Uh, I'm not sure exactly which interview you're referring to, so I can't answer the question about, you know, when was it? Uh, there's been a couple. So if you can describe the interview a bit more, I might be able to uh, remember it. Well, it's, uh, it's a long one. Uh, you are sitting in, in an office, uh, I think, in Vancouver, and... Uh, there is a female interviewer, I believe, and for about two, two and a half hours, you are talking about the uh, reforms in the oh. in the law, and then about a bit about your personal his, uh, history, then about uh, the subject of parental alienation, and then I about the, uh, yeah. I think that might have been uh, uh, somebody making a documentary. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I had, so I, I remember having... Hmm? Go ahead. Was it aired? What was the the what was if the? It, if it's the one I'm thinking about, it was a documentary that I believe was shown on television in Canada. And how was the feedback? Uh, I don't know. I, I uh, other than I've heard a few things like you're talking about it now. Um, I don't. Uh, I'm not sure I ever saw it in a final production. Uh, somewhere I have uh, a DVD of it, I'm sure, because I've got a lot. But over the years, I've given a lot of interviews, and I'm, I'm getting old, and my, my memory isn't what it should be. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the, the big question, uh, uh, this subject that you're working, uh, in the field that you're working, uh, in your personal journey, did you have to deal personally with these issues, like parental alienation, uh, bitter divorce, um, can you describe it? Yes, uh, I had the uh, my children had the great misfortune that their mother died when uh, they were uh, 14, 12 and eight years old. So I had to step in uh, and um, parent in, in that uh, I had it taught me two things. The first thing that it I got hit hard with was uh, that I had always underappreciated the vast amount of work uh, that uh, their mother, my wife, uh, had done on a daily basis that goes unrecognized. Um, uh, I think all mothers, good mothers, uh, do that. Um, the second thing I learned was that uh, fathers uh, when given the opportunity, in my case, it was forced upon me. Uh, I think these days it's it's more 
um, asked for or requested by fathers, when given that opportunity, uh, we uh, fathers can be uh, as nurturing uh, and loving and capable as the mothers. So that's, yes. that's what, uh, that, that experience um, um, was, was my background. And then uh, at one point, maybe 20 years ago, 25, maybe even 30, I don't know, I decided to try to take a break from law I wasn't doing, and, and I, I had experiences with um, uh, Robert Bly. Uh, I would go to, to uh, lectures and workshops and symposium uh, and uh, met Warren Farrell back in those days. Uh, and in the course of attending at these workshops uh, or symposiums, people would ask me, you know, what do I do? And I would say that I was a lawyer and I, I was struck by the enormous amount of questions that men had uh, about family law, about kids and custody in, in, in those terms. And I realized that uh, uh, I was interested in that. And so I uh, came sort of back into law after a year out as it were, and uh, decided to concentrate only on children's issues. Uh, there was no way I could get hired or paid um, to act for children, so I ended up having to be paid in acting for a parent, which typically was the father. Uh, and so I started to push, uh, you know, my divorce for dads, and uh, since then, uh, I was fortunate, I was just just ahead of some other movements and now in Canada at least uh, there's been great uh, progress uh, on this subject. I don't know what the situation is in Russia. It's, it's, a, it's a separate talk, yeah. Uh, by the way, since, since we're talking about Canada, uh, can I jump to the question about uh, the, re the reform, the shared parenting reform, it's still not not passed in Canada, yes? Uh, that's correct. Uh, the, um, there was a, a committee of the government uh, 20 years ago went around the country holding hearings and uh, recommended uh, some things. There was a minority report uh, by uh, a senator, a Canadian senator, uh, um, named Ann Cools, who if you ever want an interesting uh, discussion or interview, you want to call her, I could set that up for you. Anyway, sh that minority report recommended uh, a legislative uh, law that 50-50 shared parenting, equal time parenting, would be the default position. In other words, it would apply in all situations uh, unless um, uh, it obviously didn't work. I've been pushing here in British Columbia uh, for to change the law. In simple terms, for your audience, uh, now, uh, because th there is no uh, law which requires sh shared parenting. Right now, uh, if a parent, the vast majority of which are fathers, if they would like to see more of their child or children, the legal obligation is upon them to pay the lawyer to make the argument to prove to a court that the children should have more time with the father, uh, in fact, half time. Uh, that should be changed. Uh, the onus or the evidentiary burden of proof should be on the parent who wants to argue that shared parenting will not work. In other words, immediately upon separation, each parent, particularly the mothers, has got to realize that the kids will spend half time with both parents. Uh, and if one parent determines that that's not going to work, it's their obligation to go to court and satisfy a judge that it will not work. 
Now, of course, there are certain conditions that have to be met. Geography, I mean, shared parenting won't work when the parents live, you know, far apart. Uh, and also any claims by um, a parent, particularly usually the mothers, that the child comes home from the father upset or stressed or can't sleep or is making allegations, all of that should not constitute evidence. A parent should not be permitted to go into court and make those kind of unsubstantiated claims unless they have medical evidence, unless there's independent evidence that there's a problem because it's too easy otherwise. So to answer your question, at the moment, legislatively or in the laws, there is no presumption of shared parenting. However, in practice, because of work that I and have done and others, uh, and because psychologists who do reports to the court are now on side saying shared parenting is best for kids, judges often start from that position uh, and it it makes lawyers for mothers really upset when they come into court and they met what is essentially a presumption of shared parenting but that's in the minds of the judges it's not in the law how how come that uh, as far as i know the majority of, uh, of people support the idea how come that legislation is still not reflecting this uh, support? Uh, I think there's two answers to that. One is family law in this country is not a priority. Um, secondly, up in, I mean, several years ago when there was an attempt to try to do this, the and I have I've had member uh, you know uh, elected officials tell me that they are they were afraid that the feminists, the women's groups, the feminists would make such a stink about it, which they do, and the politicians thought that they might get outvoted and not get reelected. Um, but the fallacy there, the mistake they were making was to think that the feminists who scream the loudest represent anybody because by and large, they no longer do. And you're correct. There was a study done in Canada uh, a few years ago showed that massive, you know, 70 to 80% of Canadians think that the sh shared parenting is the way to go. But it, I think it's just cowardice on the part of politicians. Uh, there's a lot of money behind the feminists and women seem to be able to organize themselves a hell of a lot better than f men. And they lobby... Uh, to maintain this this false belief that men somehow are incapable of of nurturing and uh, parenting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question, Richard Allen Gardner. My understanding is that you knew him very personally, and uh, yes. Describe in, in, in a few words uh, what kind of a, what kind of work, what what scale of your work together was done? Well, Richard Gardner was a preeminent psychiatrist at uh, Columbia University in the hospitals in child psychiatry. <clears throat> and his contribution to the discussion was that many, many years ago, he noticed that parental alienation could, if it was extreme, could cause a child to make up their own false allegations that these children would come to believe as fact. And he uh, determined and stated that these children suffered from a psychiatric illness. And the uh, book that he subsequently wrote, uh, Parental Alienation Syndrome, uh, was the beginning of this whole discussion. Uh, he said that uh, parental alienation could be seen uh, where uh, the child would be making things up, 
uh, complaining about a parent for frivolous reasons, like they didn't like the cooking, would exclude family members. There's a whole list of, of things that he did. The, the, the feminist movement in the United States particularly uh, jumped all over him, uh, alleging falsely that fathers were accusing mothers of alienating the children as a way to avoid admitting that they, the fathers, were abusive. In other words, the feminists were saying that parental alienation was permitting abusive fathers to blame the mother, uh, which was just nonsense. Uh, and then a, a bunch of psychologists started to uh, join in on that and attacking Gardner that it really wasn't a syndrome uh, and so now, if you find one of these new psychologists who talk about estrangement and the reasons that kids do this, if you ask them, and I've, I've had them on the witness stand where I cross-examine them, they essentially agree to everything Gardner said. So he still is the, the foundation and his theories still are the, the fundamentals as far as I'm concerned. I had him on a couple of cases where there was parental alienation and he he does something, uh, he did things that his, his method of uh, interviews and evaluation were unlike anything that happens in Canada. In Canada, if a psychologist is going to prepare a report for the court, they will interview the father alone, the mother alone, they will visit the father with the children, the mother with the children, they'll hear the allegations and complaints. Uh, if the children are old enough, they'll meet with the children and talk with the children. What Gardner did was at every meeting he had, everybody was in the room. In other words, when he was interviewing the mother, the father was in the room, not the kids. And if the mother made some statement uh, when she finished, he would give the father the opportunity to reply to it. And it worked out really well. Uh, he, it was kind of as if it was more like um, it exposed things. People that the parents were challenged as to their 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 beliefs. In other words, if a mother said that my my eight year old son came home and told me that his father kicked him, he would ask the mother, "Do you believe that?" And he would ask the father, "Did you kick him?" And the father would deny it, and then he'd say to the mother do you believe the father or vice versa? In other words, he made the parents come to terms with reality of what was going on. Uh, I have a case right now, uh, which is a very sad case, where a 12-year-old, after six years of a week on, week off, equal time shared parenting, suddenly uh, started making outrageous allegations against the father to the mother and has repeated them to doctors and psychiatrists. And the psychiatrist believes the child, and I'm of the belief that this child has developed a psychiatric condition. The child is mentally ill, and no one's looking at that, and the doctors refuse to, to look at what's called a differential diagnosis. Uh, so um, Gardner did that. Uh, Richard Gardner was one of the most humorous men I have ever met. He was just full of marvelous jokes. He, uh, he knew his stuff. He was confident. And the other thing that he was, uh, I found, uh, I learned a lot from him is that when a child starts to say things to the father, like mom says you're bad or this or that, uh, you know, too many psychologists around here tell, and lawyers particularly are the worst, they tell the father, leave it alone, don't argue, don't upset it, give the mother time, she'll come around. That's a huge mistake. When this happens, you have to step in and uh, tackle it right away. So that's my answer for that one. Yeah, that's a really sad story you told about. Uh, in this old, uh, in old lecture, which is published in your YouTube channel of Richard Gardner, you mentioned that he had done some work in Russia. Is it true? Oh, I did. I, I, I I don't know. Um, it, it's certainly possible. I, unfortunately, as far as I know, the terrific website he had up, which was very helpful, uh, may not be 
there anymore. Somebody undertook after he died for several years ago to keep it alive, but uh, at the moment I'm I don't know how you'd find the answer to that. Okay. Uh, what about the DSM? Anybody is pushing this issue still or not? DSM four, DSM five. I'm I'm not sure. I mean it. It didn't. It did not make it as a as a as a an illness. The, the PAS or the parental alienation syndrome did not make it into the DSM five. But there are other aspects, other entries into the DSM five that. Uh, discuss some of the um, behavior that come about, but basically, it's it's it was not uh, acknowledged as uh, as I believe it should have been, and it'll be ten years before there's another one, and I have I'm unaware of any further uh, attempts at the moment. I think that the the uh, the health professionals who uh, work with parentally alienated children, the good ones, have found ways to uh, convince judges how to, uh, to deal with it. In other words, it doesn't matter what you call something, as long as you can prove to a judge that behaviors of the child are unacceptable by any other explanation. Uh, if you can show a judge that a child is demonstrating all of the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, all of the um, symptoms that Gardner wrote about, it doesn't matter what you call it. If, I'll try to give you an example. Um, if, uh, if somebody is a diabetic, you should be able to prove to a judge that the person has um, a problem with insulin and sugar and explain what an imbalance in insulin can do to the body. You explain what diabetes is. You don't have to call it diabetes. You can call it whatever you like, as long as you can satisfy the court and prove that there is an illness. Do you follow what I mean? Yeah, very wise. That's that's interesting. Okay, so it's so, not so an issue. In the, just, I'm sorry. It's not an issue in the court. Yeah. Um, well, it is, but you don't have you can you can sidestep it and get around the objections. Okay. Uh, speaking of courts, uh, I might read from my from the question I prepared. Uh, from the state of our family law system, I mean Russia. My approximation is we are about 25 to 30 years behind Canada and USA. But the lawmakers clearly push us in the same direction. From a special committee for the issues of family, women, and children, we have a document, the concept of family politics till 2025, from which you would recognize all the points. As a lawyer and a law reformist, what would you tell our lawmakers not to repeat? What were the awful reforms, bad changes, destructive experience in regards to the family law in Canada during the last 25, 30 years? Um, what? And I'm, I'm not quite sure. So you, you want me to talk about what they should look out for, what they should not do? Should not repeat, yeah. I see. Um, I don't know. I, I mean... <clears throat> The Americans have a slightly different way, uh, the law there. The, there the, many years ago, some individuals, uh, very dedicated men, lobbied and spoke hard and long for many years with the state lawmakers, California, some of the states. And some of the states have put forward some time ago some very progressive family law regulations. Uh, some states have not. Uh, I don't know if 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 you can you ask can you answer me this? In Russia, will there be one 
law for the whole country or will different uh, judicial or state areas within the country have their own? Uh, that's a complicated question. Uh, for formally, formally, the law is the one and it's for, for the whole country. But since we have uh, 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 republics, well, it, in US, in USSR, it was called republics. They are still inside, uh, still comprise the uh, Russia. So they have a, so let's say, local, local ways to interpret the laws. So the practice of the law might not be the same as, say, in Moscow and in Chechnya. It's a different story. But the law is the same, yes. The law is the same. So, yes. so, so basically, it's, it's the people in the Kremlin who are going, or the government, who's going to make the law. Is that right? Yes, correct. Okay. Um, well, they, I think they have to start, or they should be persuaded and lobbied to think about the law, uh, what I call a rebuttable presumption of shared parenting. Uh, in, other, in other words, that the, the, the assumption is upon separation, the kids will be parented by both parents where physically possible, uh, equally. Uh, that the modern uh, pedagogy or the study of children uh, shows that that is by far the best for the children. The children come out of that much better off than either of the other options. Um, and uh, it saves a lot of strife and money and it keeps people out of court. I, I will give you an example as to how this worked years ago. In, in uh, every province in Canada and territory, of which there are 10, each one had their own law with respect to what happens in a divorce to property. And it used to be that if a a farm or a ranch uh, or a business was in the name of the husband and they'd been married for 20 years, the wife had to hire a lawyer, spend a lot of money to prove that she should get one half of the value of the farm or the ranch or the company. Then 20 years ago, the, all of the provinces uh, and territories got together with the federal government, well, it was just on their own, and they all passed laws which said essentially this, that immediately upon getting married, there was a rebuttable presumption. You understand what I mean by rebuttable? It's a presumption which somebody has the freedom to try to argue against. Yes, correct. You but it. And that was that immediately upon marriage, each, the husband and the wife, each had a one half interest in whatever property the other was in their name. So if a woman marries a man who already owns a million dollar company, the upon upon sep, upon divorce. If the parties lived together for 10 years, the judges would say that that means 50-50. If, if you get married, if a woman marries a millionaire and wants to divorce him in a month, she might get, you know, $50,000. She certainly wouldn't get half a million. In other words, you can't just take half. You can claim it, but you don't get it until and unless you've been married a long time. Now, what that did was that in my practice, if a, a man came in and said to me he was divorcing his wife or his wife was divorcing him, and he had, um, uh, they lived in a house that was in his name that was worth $100,000, I would tell him if they'd been married eight or 10 years, I would just say, half of that's hers. End of discussion. End of story. No debate. He wouldn't pay me a dollar to try to get him more than half. And that has saved a lot of money. It has saved a lot of court time. If we had the same 
principle in with respect to children the same result would happen pretty much now having said that it is my experience and the experience of family lawyers who have been doing this for years that the most difficult cases involve in my experience women tragic tragic women who the majority of which it's it's striking the majority of whom had very unfortunate experiences in their childhood either they were sexually abused physically abused or abandoned or felt they were abandoned and they have personality disorders that they do not acknowledge and have never dealt and i would say 70 to 80 percent of the cases i'm involved with for fathers trying to see their children uh, the mothers on the other side are these tragic individuals who require the children to satisfy their own emotional needs in other words the way i put it is that these these women um, have a hole in their psyche they, they, they have not dealt with their their childhood trauma and they depend upon the children to give them the parent emotional relief i call that emotional incest it should be the other way around it's the parent who's supposed to provide the emotional support for the child uh, so these individuals will always be in court no matter what the law is um, one of the things I, I can tell you, uh, you asked me a very specific question. One of the problems that I see is that over the years, many well-intentioned, idealistic thinking scholars, uh, uh, politicians, uh, judges, are always talking about there has to be a better way to resolve family dissolution custody things than this antagonistic court system and they they are putting in place all kinds of hoops that people have to jump through they want to make it a requirement that you have mediation they want to make it a requirement that you do this a requirement that you do that that you can't go to court until you've done this or done that <clears throat> They put so many uh, roadblocks before you can actually get into court and ask for something. Now, that, that might be useful for rational individuals. Uh, if, if there's rationality between a mother and a father, a husband and wife, if they're rational people, they will come to an agreement and, and not end up in trial. But what this does is that when, you're, when there is an irrational, personality disordered parent, the vast majority of which I think statistically are women rather than men and in terms of experience, um, what those do is they prevent the father from being able to cut to the chase. From, they prevent the father from cutting through and making a court realize that it is the other parents problem that's causing the problems it, judges have this well I suppose it's a good thing and a bad thing judges like to assume that the mother and father standing before them in court are both good parents and rational people and that is one of the biggest mistakes judges make uh, in my practice and in the practice of lawyers who deal with these extremely conflicted high conflict cases is always the case that one or the other and sometimes both but more or less one or the other of the parents is personality disordered has a mental illness and uh, you have to call a spade a spade uh, I will often say uh, to a judge that 
one of our, talking about my lawyer on the other side, my friend, I'll say one of us has a parent who is unfit. Either my father client should not have anything to do with these kids or the mother client shouldn't. So let's just get to it and call a spade a spade. Judges react against that with a, an incredible, uh, oh, don't say that. You're being, you're being litigious. Let's try to resolve this. Let's try to be friendly about this. Let's not blame people. <clears throat> well, if that was true, these two parents would not be standing in front of them in the first place. So that's a problem. Uh, so what I'm saying is one of the problems is putting, if you're going to put a whole bunch of uh, programs in place to force parents to go through before they can get into a real, before a judge in a trial, there should be an escape clause. There should be some way to get around that when you've got a situation where the mother is not letting the kids see the father. <clears throat> uh, I, I, maybe I haven't said that as best I could, but that's one thing that comes to mind. Um, I'm not sure I can think of too many others. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of this depends upon the, the psychologist. I don't know <clears throat> in Russia if the practice is as it is in North America that in high conflict cases like this, <clears throat> psychologists get retained expensive to prepare a, an evaluation for the judge to give the judge some idea as to what the family dynamics are. Do you have that? Well, mostly on high profile only. Yes, right. May, may I jump back a little? I'm just curious. Uh, you said that uh, if a, a woman marries a millionaire and in 10 years she gets half, do you think personally it's just? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Uh, in some circumstances, yes. Uh, I think it depends upon what the, the couple understood and agreed to going into the marriage. Um, clearly, uh, the old example is that uh, a, a young man would inherit uh, a dairy farm, maybe a hundred cows, uh, and from his parents who die, and he'd marry a pretty young girl who'd come and work, and the woman would work in the house uh, and raise his kids, and he'd be out on the tractor plowing the fields, milking the cows, and uh, she'd help from time to time. Uh, and he would be able to make money selling his milk. And the argument is he couldn't be doing that as well if she wasn't looking after the family and doing all the things she's doing. So clearly there has to be a financial compensation. <clears throat> that's, one, that's one thing. But it gets abused where... Uh, in, 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 I, there's so many examples. It gets abused in, in the modern day when both parents can go out and work the place that it gets abused the most is not in that, it's in child support. Uh, the law in Canada and all of the provinces, and I, I don't know about in, in Russia, is that upon separation, if one parent has the child primarily with them, i.e. the mother usually, and the mother mm -hmm. is not working or is working and maybe making uh, $30,000 a year, uh, and the father uh, is very well paid and is maybe making $100,000 a year, the father has to pay the mother, uh, we'll say $1,000 a month for the child, for child support. And the problem is if that mother remarries a millionaire who makes a million dollars a year, she still gets child support from the father. So the father making $100,000 a year has to give $1,000 a month to the mother who doesn't need it, who gets it from her, you know, that stays there. That is, a, that is a, a criminal situation, it seems to me, because what it's doing, not only does the father not get, I mean, you know, the mother doesn't need it, and the father, it prevents the father from having some extra money with which he could do things and support the child. Um, so th there's a there's a huge fault. Um, the other one is is spousal support. The uh, <clears throat> when mothers separate, 
there is a tendency that the support that the courts tend to support that the woman maybe had a, a, a good paying job before marriage. Maybe she was a whatever. She had a pretty good job as a in a in a clerk as a store or a secretary or a nurse or something. And then she loses her ability to do that after 10 years. So she wants to go out and learn counseling or, you know, the, the, the joke is basket weaving. The courts <laughs> will make the father pay her uh, money to go out and do something which is not going to make her very much money rather than be serious and go back to work at what she was doing or just go out <clears throat> and get a job, even if it's just working for McDonald's, selling hamburgers. Uh, the, the, the courts don't put as much on the mother, but the father, if the father has done the same, he's supposed to go out and get any laboring job he can find. That's a gender bias in the system. Uh, but all of these are moving slowly. There's a long way to go, but they're a lot better now than they were 10, 15 years ago. In Russia, it's, uh, it's the same problem. Uh, uh, after, if if uh, a wife remarries, then the, the kids are still legally the kids of the father. So the father has to pay alimony. No, no matter it's, uh, how much the new husband uh, earns, does not concern anyone. It doesn't matter because it's his own. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> it gets even more bizarre. <clears throat> if, if, uh, if, a, if a man marries... Um, a woman who has already has a child from her previous marriage, um, then the um, so a guy has a stepson. He's married a woman who has a five-year-old child from a previous marriage. Uh, this uh, this man stays married for ten years and then divorces. The father of the stepson, the, the father of the original boy, he's paying child support. And then now the stepfather, he's also on the hook for child support. Um, and there's a certain unfairness in that, particularly if the mother uh, has married somebody who is perfectly capable of supporting all the kids. Yeah, that's too bad. Speaking of which, uh, that's one of the main themes that... Uh, permits the movement for the moment, uh, because many men come to men's rights movement, men's rights sites, men's rights books, after something terrible happened to their family life, yeah, in, in right. one way or the other, like a divorce, yeah. uh, a separation from children, or maybe a, a trickery into having children and so on. So one of the main themes, especially for the newcomers, is a lot, a lot of anger. And this is still actually a personal issue for me, myself. <laughs> Many years has passed, but still. Uh, so uh, what, what, what advice would you give to people who, who are just, uh, just, uh, just came to this, just, just starting to realize what system they were in? Well, we haven't got enough time on that one. I'm just finishing a book, which I hope to get out this summer, which I've been working on for 12 or 15 years. Uh, it's a... It's a handbook for single fathers to represent themselves in court if they cannot afford a lawyer. Uh, it also, uh, more than half of the book is dedicated to trying to get these men to understand the necessity of um, taking advantage of this horrible time to rediscover within themselves who they really are, what they wanted to be, and what they can be um, uh, for two reasons. One is if you are basically living in hell, um, angry, the world is turned against you, you can't see your child. Um, it, it sounds difficult to accept, but that is a, a unique opportunity for that man to try and work himself out of that in the best and most healthy way possible. And that includes 
uh, mindfulness, meditation, uh, psychotherapy if he requires it, a lot of anger management help um, for two reasons. One is that if, the, if this guy can separate from the past, not let the memories or the uh, ideas of the past cause that kind of sharp anger, get over that uh, and discover how they want to be a better person in life, uh, two things happen. Three things happen. They are a better father. Uh, they uh, are a better uh, person in front of a judge. A judge will see that this individual is sincere. This, in, this individual has been able to cut loose and remove the antagonism, the anger, and and uh, as strange as it sounds, I urge men to have compassion and sympathy for the mother of their child, even if she's completely crazy, because unless she's so crazy that you can get custody of the child, and the mother just has every other weekend or something, mm -hmm. uh, and that's hard to do, unless that, that child needs a, a mother. And uh, unless the mother's craziness or her behavior or whatever it is, even if she's not crazy, as long as that's not bad for the child, then she's going to be there. So these guys have got to, you know, come to terms with them. The, the metaphor I use is that, um, you know, on, on big trucks, the big freight trucks, they have these enormous mirrors outside of each, each window. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're huge mirrors, and you look out there and you can see everything in the past. Well, yeah. my, my metaphor is that coming out of, of a divorce, we have these enormous mirrors on our shoulders, bigger than my hands. And what they do is they prevent you from seeing too much ahead. They block your view forward, and they're constantly reminding you of what's behind you. So you're always thinking about the past. You hear her voice. You see what she's doing. You remember the bad times. You remember the, you know, all the issues that you had with her. It's all there constantly, 24 hours a day. Uh, some psychologists uh, and some uh, counselors will tell you just to remove the mirrors. Well, that's impossible. Those people, you should just never talk to them again. What I say you, you need to do is over time you turn those mirrors so that they sh show you less of what's behind you and they open up more of what you can see ahead. And if you turn them, they'll always be there. Uh, so you can't just get rid of them. I suppose if you want to be a monk uh, or a yogi, you can probably do something which gets rid of them. But they're there. That's your history. But the point being is you've just got to cut from the past and get on with your life. Uh, as we say in English, shit happens. You know, get over it. Uh, too, many, too many men have enormous difficulties uh, doing that. The first problem is most men don't even think about it. Most people have no idea that that's an approach you should take. Those that do have difficulty trying to do it. And the few... Uh, and I'm hoping to push on that, and it's happening. Uh, mindfulness and meditation is, a, is really big uh, in helping men do this, and women. I mean, it's great for anybody, kids, everybody. So uh, that this book is going to come out. Uh, and to get back to the question is, how do you deal with the anger? Um, well, uh, one example. Um, if... My, my belief is that women know what buttons to push on a man to get a reaction much better than men know what buttons to push on a woman. Women are much better than men at what I call emotional abuse, assault. Uh, and so if, you, if your ex, if your former wife, used to call you names in really bad things that would really get you upset. For instance, they say, well, you're just like your 
father. You're as bad as your father who used to beat your mother. You know, if, if that's coming down constantly, what you do is you, you, you find somebody, a woman, and you tell this woman uh, what you want the woman to say to you, and you, an actress, really, and you have this woman accost you, attack you verbally, as your former wife used to, uh, until you can just ignore it. Uh, so that the next time that idea comes into your head, it doesn't have the same response. Because it's, it's how we feel and how we react are things we determined. There's nothing inherently in the statement or the memory which has, is positive or negative. It's all how we respond to it. As an example, if you are standing, I don't know what the equivalent is in Russia, but we have some places in Canada, the Grand Canyon in the United States. It's a huge place. Anywhere where you can get an echo. You stand somewhere and you yell. Oh, you, you yell your name, Carrie. And then it comes back to you from across. Carrie, Carrie, Carrie. You go, oh, isn't that nice? And you say, you yell out, Carrie, you're such a great guy. And you hear yourself come back. Wow. But then you hear... Somebody yell, you hear, Carrie, you're an asshole. And what happens? You get all excited and nervous. What? And what is it? It's just your name coming in. It's just words. But you choose how you're going to react. So you have to train yourself not to let the input cause the same response. Everything that, that, that you experienced in life you react to it as you wish, other than putting your finger in an electric plug and getting electrocuted. But whatever you see, whatever you say, nothing is right or wrong, as Shakespeare said, except thinking thinking it so. Uh, this is a very simple uh, idea, very difficult to incorporate into your life, and it takes a lot of practice. Another... Uh, thing that I have people do is uh, you take an, a rubber band and you stick it on your wrist and every time you think of you, you, you every time this your ex who infuriates you every time there's an image of her comes up or any thought of her comes up you take the rubber band and you go wham and that hurts and you do this it can happen you can you can see differences in a day or two or a week every time that image comes up you go like this now, what's happening is biofeedback in your system, unconsciously, your system is saying before they let that image come out, they know if they let the image out into your consciousness, you're going to get whacked and it hurts. They'll hold back because they don't want to get injured. I mean, there's, a, there's all kinds of little tricks. I call them Zen tricks that you can do. Uh, images. If you see, if you know, if you constantly see her face, and it really bugs you, every time you see that face, you have a, 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 a biological uh, <clears throat> it just it just it tenses you up automatically. <laughs> then, what you do is what I I had this happen to me in my life, and I've tell people, you what's the best image you have? What's what's your most favorite image in all the world? To me, it's a mountaintop, clear snow. Maybe it's a forest. Maybe it's a bouquet of flowers. But each person has to create in their mind an alternative image, a great image. And, and, and you fix on it. You practice it. So you've got a set image. And then the next time the ex, the crazy mother, comes up in your mind, you bring in, you consciously try to substitute that image for her. And you do this every single time. And what naturally happens is the next, at some point, it may be weeks, it may be a month, maybe less, when the image of her face comes up, automatically your preferred image comes up next to it. And sooner or later, her image just, just goes way down and you've got this picture for me of flowers. I mean, you have to understand the uh, hormonal how this is all happening. You have to understand how your mind is dealing with this. If I'm making myself understood. Yes, uh, I do. The example is that if you're walking down 
and uh, in the jungle and a tiger suddenly comes at you and you luckily you're saved your your flight response is hormonal if you then see a picture on a movie of a tiger doing that your body gives you the exact same hormones and you have to start to train yourself to understand the differences there so um, uh, I'm talking on at length here, but that's those are just some ideas. That's interesting. What's the name of the book? Ah, uh, I think it's going to be uh, Dad, uh, Win Without a Lawyer. <laughs> well, you'll, I'll let you know about it. It'll be on Amazon. It's, I'm self-publishing it. Um, I'm, I've got it all basically finished. We're going through an editing, and uh, I'm, I'm trying to... Uh, Every time I look at it, I have more ideas. I just have to stop. I mean, I, there's got to be an end to it. <laughs> uh, well, we're looking what ahead you, to it. Yeah, what, what kind of work do you do? I'm in IT. I work in IT. At the ah, moment, I see. I'm a bit of a manager in IT. <laughs> yeah. ah, good for you. Yeah. Uh, I, got, I got an email from somebody else. I'll, uh, I'll send it to you. There's another guy. Maybe you know him. Uh, he mentioned someone that I didn't know who wanted to, was interested in something. Um, you guys should get together and, and, and invite me over for a conference or something. You mentioned Warren, Warren Farrell is in Europe right now on a Psychology of Men conference. That's really interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. This is my first. Yeah. This is, my, this is my first Skype interview, so it's, it's fun. I wish I could see you. All I'm looking at is this interesting picture. It's kind of a round face. From time to time. Uh, yeah. Okay, okay may I uh, do, we have, do we still have some time? Oh, sure, take your time. Sure. Uh, may I jump to a very interesting question? What's your take on the mail pill? Why it's still not available? Despite of all the research, investment, and the news that's coming constantly, where is it? I'm sorry, the, the what deal? The mail pill. Mail the pill. Ma oh, the mail pill? Yes, yes. Oh. Ha. Ah, I don't know. I, I, I know that I haven't heard about it for a while. I know that uh, some time ago there was that opportunity. Are you talking about a mail pill for contraceptive? Yes, correct. Yeah. Um, it's a very good question. I don't know why it's not available. Clearly, if they have such a thing, it should be available. I, I can't think of any argument that, that would uh, convince me otherwise. What Do you know what the arguments are against it? No. Well, n n nothing except what the feminists say. But uh, do you think it may be deliberate that it's not available? Oh, yeah, listen, if the feminists were doing it, why are they feminists against it? Because it gives, uh, it shifts the controls, shifts ah, the pendulum. Right. Let, let, let me mention for a minute uh, this discussion of feminists. Uh, <clears throat> back in the 1960s, when I was at university, it was the beginning of what was called the women's movement, um, women's liberation movement, which was a, uh, a very uh, uh, marvelous uh, and overdue a movement uh, where everybody I ever knew, all the men, were strongly in favor of letting all things female be equal to male. Um, and uh, that went along for many years. And then eventually, um, and that, that turned into the feminist movement. And if, if the feminist movement is defined as equality, that's okay, but there were uh, some feminists who were called radical feminists or whatever they were, who were looking for advantage. Um, the most extreme of those are the ones that would say that uh, sex is rape no matter what. Um, these uh, feminists are not feminists. Uh, I refer to them as uh, either gender feminists or victim feminists, women. And, and I think that most women reject the definition of feminism or being a feminist because of the uh, 
overreaction and uh, embarrassment that these uh, gender feminists or victim feminists, the victim feminists are the one who, who blame everything on men. Uh, and the test that I urge people to use is when you hear a man or a woman saying something about men, if, if you want to determine whether that's a, an unbigoted statement or a biased statement, find the sentence, the, the statement, and substitute for the word men, the word Jew, Jew or black. And uh, you will then see if that is a bigoted statement. If you can, if, and it's amazing how many statements people make in society against men that if they were to say Jew or black, in some jurisdictions they'd be committing an offense, uh, uh, if you follow what I mean. And, and the, the men and women, I mean, some of the worst people around are, are these men who have completely fallen for this victim feminist line. Uh, I, I meet them, uh, you, you're walking down the, somewhere and there's a, a guy with a, trying to raise money, a little sign for battered women's shelters. And I'll say, hey, I'll give you 10 bucks if you'll tell me where I can give 10 bucks to battered men's shelters. And uh, the response uniformly is, men getting battered by women? Are you kidding? It never happens. Now, the research is absolutely clear and unequivocal. There's, there's a parity. There's a, basically a 50-50 split. Neither gender has a monopoly on violence. The, uh, the men, of course, being bigger, tend to go a little bit more often on the, on the physical side, whereas the women will be more throwing things, uh, uh, verbal abuse, uh, slapping, pushing, pulling hair, uh, those kinds of things. So the idea that, you know, but men, th these things don't do it. And it's interesting because men's groups are unable to get financial government support. Women's groups used to get millions, tens of millions of dollars. Uh, there was a thing in the paper here the other week. Uh, in Halifax, Nova Scotia, a province in eastern Canada, uh, some money is being produced to help men deal with anger against women. So at first blush, you, someone might say, oh, we're giving some money to a men's organization here to help with their issues. But the reason they're doing it is because they, the money really is to teach men not to abuse women. So that's, that's money for women, essentially. Uh, so you have to keep your eye out on that one. Anyway, next question. I forgot what the question was. Oh, the pill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know what. I don't know pill. why the pills. Yeah, yeah. No, clearly, um, these um, th th these women's groups uh, who are uh, victim feminists. Uh, they they're really good at organizing and, and politicizing. Uh, fortunately, <clears throat> slowly, the politicians are starting to not give out as much money as they used to to groups who just you know, do this. Okay, thanks. The next one is um, the political branches, the communism and capitalism. Why do you think that they become so much alike in the issues regarding marriage, children, divorce, and so on? I've never, I've never thought about that. That's a fascinating question. I, my immediate reaction is at the base, it's, it's family. We, we all come from a family, uh, and uh, uh, the, the destruction of the family that capitalism has caused uh, is, is a, is written about. It's a thesis that's been around for a long time. People go back and talk about the Industrial Revolution being the beginning of the end of the family. Uh, communism, uh, I'm not sure. I, I, to me, there has never been a communist state. I've always regarded the Soviet Union as uh, socialism tending towards an ideal of communism 
then turned into state capitalism, and that's what China is, state capitalism. Cuba, where I travel a lot and, and love dearly, uh, is an interesting thing. Uh, I hear about, but I have never visited the Indian state of Kerala, which is supposed to be socialism to the point of almost being communism. So I don't know if we can ever look at a communist society and see what the family would be there. I don't know. But in, in the most advanced socialists, and I don't think that the Soviet Union could be called an advanced socialist state. It had too many problems. Uh, there could have been some in the, in the Caribbean, in Grenada, Cuba, uh, Nicaragua had the Americans not, you know, done their best to cripple them. But it's an interesting question, and uh, I think that uh, no matter who we are, whether we're uh, an apparatchik or a, uh, uh, you know, a commissar in, in, in the Soviet Union or uh, a Wall Street banker in capitalism, we all have children, we all have our ideas, and we have our regrets and, and our love and, and this and that, and uh, it's a very interesting question. I don't know the answer to that. If you find it, let me know. Okay, I will. Yeah. Okay, the next one. Um, I'm not sure if, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, the same-sex marriages are now uh, in force in, uh, in Canada, correct? Correct. Uh, do you think it's, um, I don't know, feasible or possible that two normal guys could use these same-sex marriages as to organize uh, a new kind of a union under the law and have children from surrogate mothers just using the system for whatever it is, and at the same time uh, working outside of a common uh, family law system. Do you think it's uh, one of the ways? Yeah, I, that, that's, that's my understanding. I mean, I know personally I've had clients uh, I know that's what's happening in Canada. Uh, you know, uh, uh, gay guys and, and lesbian women can get married lawfully. Uh, they can have children by a variety of means. Um, oh, just, just, the, just, to, I, just to be clear, I'm specifically meaning heterosexual men. Two heterosexual men. Right. So no, no, not 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 gay guys, not lesbians, heterosexual. Oh, oh, oh two heterosexual men. Yes. Getting married. Yes. Sure, why not? I mean, I, <laughs> I don't know. I've never heard. That's a hell of an interesting thought. Uh, so two two friends decide they want to get married for whatever reason. It's kind of like, yeah. Um, uh, Boston legal. That may not mean anything to you, but um, and then they want to have a child that, it, that is theirs that they adopt uh, and they raise. I don't see why not. I I I, I don't know that if, you know two men go into a church. They go to to the to the government and they get a marriage license. Uh, I don't know whether you have to state on the marriage license that you're gay. I would doubt it. That's none of their business. Um, it's a fascinating question. I'm going, to, I'm going to start asking a whole bunch of people that because it's, it's interesting. <laughs> yeah. it, just, it, it came to my mind that it could be a way to go around these uh, laws without having to change them. You can go just go around with your companion, your long-term companion. We all know that uh, single-sex uh, marriages are much more stable. Uh, two men, when two men are involved, it's much more stable than any other kind of, uh, of marriage. It could be, and I have heard, I've never met anybody, I've heard that uh, women, uh, straight women, uh, on occasion, tend to end up living together. Yes, for, for the reasons of uh, getting benefits from the law and having nothing to risk. Yeah. Huh. I, I'll have to think about that. Offhand, I don't see why, I mean, it seems to me it should be done, it could be done. I can't. I, 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 if, if anybody started doing that, I would. I would love to hear the reaction of the uh, conservative evangelical right in the United States. 
Uh, that's an idea you could use. We still don't have it in our law, but you have. You can use it. Yeah. What where what is the state of the law in in Russia with respect to uh, uh, gay marriages? No, it's not. Uh, it's not. Uh, Permitted, it's not available, and uh, basically it's looked looked upon very in a very bad way. Let's see. Yeah, yeah. There was this uh, one big question I wanted to ask you. Um, I think we can call it the final one uh, on the subject of letting go of this, uh, yeah, freeing yourself from from the from the past and so on. Uh, I sent you a, a short quote of uh, Neil Postman. Uh, talking on a different subject, but uh, essentially <clears throat> he had the thought that uh, adaptation is not always uh, the proper way to react to things because people are capable to adapt into almost anything. So the things that uh, we're talking about now, like um, uh, meditation, psychology, self-control, um, I don't know, physical exercise and so on, these are all ways to adapt to, let's say, trauma, yeah? trauma to a father, trauma to a divorced man. Um, if we take it en masse, maybe if, if we are not, uh, if we are just adapting to it, maybe we are holding the changes back. Maybe in some way we are contributing to the problem because we are not, uh, not, we are not making any great changes, not pushing back violently against it, you know. So maybe if, if each of us has a choice and the choice is, uh, I'm going to just uh, resolve this issue for myself. Yeah, I'm going to therapy, I'm meditating and so on. That if if each of us has this uh, makes this choice, then nothing great is uh, happens in, in regards to reforms, in regards to the reaction from the public, from uh, feminists, from women and so on, from the government. So maybe could it be that uh, ad by adapting to this situation, we are actually prolonging it for ourselves. Well, that's another good question. So you're you're suggesting that rather than do what I'm suggesting, that one should uh, fight back, uh, resist, uh, not take it. Uh, is that what you're suggesting? Yes, in one in one way or, or another, yeah. Let I me remind you. Let me remind you of it. Yeah. Go ahead. What remind me of what? Do you know the name Thomas James Ball? No. That's the guy who set himself on fire in the USA. Oh, okay. So maybe. It, I'm not suggesting, uh, not inviting people to repeat what he did, but it clearly was not an adaptation. It was a, a protest, a way that he chose for himself to make. Okay, I, so, so <clears throat> I, I'm not sure that I would, I think on an individual case for each father, I would still recommend that they rediscover their soul. In other words, something has died in their relationship, their dream, their hero. We all want to be heroes. When we're kids, we want to be firemen. When we're teenagers, we want to be Bill Gates or lawyers. And, you know, we have, we, we all want to get married to the pretty girl. We want to have a family. It's, it's, a, it's a hero mentality. That comes crashing down. And, uh, We've, we've been on the wrong track. We have to rediscover our soul. So I'm saying I think each individual should stay on this, what I'm suggesting. But what you're suggesting, and I've seen that and I do agree, is that there are ways that <clears throat> men together, <clears throat> or individually, I think burning yourself is an extreme, can make a difference. There was a, a group of fathers uh, here over the years that would have uh, pull off big stunts. Um, the, the best one was they all got a couple guys got dressed up in Superman costumes or Batman costumes, and they made a great big banner, and they went up on a bridge with a lot of traffic. And uh, uh, you know, fathers' rights or fathers are good people or this and that. Um, 
And that that has an effect. Uh, the, the first reaction is what a bunch of kooks those are. What a crazy men. But and if they do it again and then people start to talk, you yeah, know, that's the point. And that all helps. Um, I I once wanted to uh, put an ad together uh, uh, years ago. I was going to show a, a fireman coming out of a building with a baby in his arms. Um, and uh, it was going to be a promotional ad for me for my d divorce for men. And it was going to say, you know, we trust these men with our children, but they can't see their own. Uh, and I had another one with a, uh, a doctor or something. But that point I'm making is I think that kind of marketing, you have to sell the idea. And, and what you're suggesting is all good marketing. Let's, but I don't know that I, 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 yeah, I think, I think that it, unfortunately the media no longer pays any attention in Canada to individual divorce files unless they are really bizarre. It used to be that, you know, uh, if, if a guy was, was really being given a, an impossible time in court, you know, they, you could tell the paper, a paper would come down and write about it, but they don't do that anymore. So it's really the, the media is out. The, uh, you're, what you're doing is, is the future, obviously. And uh, it's why I'm delighted and so thankful to be able to talk to you like this because, uh, you, you know, individual men who are concerned and care do this and they'll tell other people and uh, it's, it's a revolution and it's happening slowly. Not fast enough. And as I, I don't know whether you're 20 years behind. I, I suspect you may be 20 years behind, but I also suspect that to catch up won't take 20 years. Well, let's hope so. Yeah. yeah. Do, do you believe a, a father alone can raise a perfectly normal child? Absolutely. Whether, whether it's be boy or girl. Either one. You know, there, there, there's a, uh, there was a Sweden is always the example we refer to for uh, surveys. Uh, there was uh, some work done in Sweden uh, where thousands of people were surveyed and they looked at the results of children when they became in their 20s who came from three different categories of families. One would be an intact family mother and father. One would be kids raised primarily by their mothers and the third would be kids raised primarily by their fathers. And when they looked at all the indicia or criteria, uh, employment, health, education, um, ability to, to sustain a relationship with the opposite gender, when they looked at all of those parameters, the, the ones who came out on top, the best children, were those raised by single fathers. The second were those raised by intact mothers and fathers. And the third were those raised by mothers alone. Now, before all the men jump and say whoop de doo uh, you have to realize that there are factors underneath that that require attention. Uh, Mothers who end up raising their kids by themselves, a large proportion of that demographic uh, are poor, relatively speaking, and probably have needs that they can't meet and the children suffer. Whereas fathers who end up raising the children by themselves as a demographic have two things to explain it. One is that they've probably had a lot of drive and ambition and love to put themselves in that position, to obtain that position, and also they probably had more money to achieve it. Uh, however, the other problem in family law, which is really difficult, is that there are so many statistics that say this is good for a child, but you can't get a judge to put any weight 
on statistics because they're so trained to look only at this one individual case. Because ideally, if you were to follow the outcome of that Swedish thing, anytime a dad comes in and says, I want to raise the kid, and the mom says, I want the kid, give it to the dad. Because statistics tells you that at the end of it all, those children will do better than the other ones. Uh, I understand the problem with that, but the point being is that that's the statistics. Uh, and again, we're stuck with having to argue each individual case, if you get what I'm saying. So to go back to the thing about fathers, of course, they can do a good job. I also I had a specific. A, yeah, yeah. I, I had uh, I've got a case now where uh, two uh, gay men uh, have an adopted child uh, who's nine or twelve. And um, the, the men, uh, they were common law, but they've separated. And the, the, the boy was going back half and half. And, and the boy is upset uh, with the one of his dads and uh, wants to live with the other one of his dads, my client. Uh, and I've always been fascinated. And every time I meet uh, a gay couple, whether they be lesbians or gay guys and have children by someone, I tell them, how are the kids doing? And I've never heard anybody say that their kids are having any, you know, gender identification problems or all the things that the right wing fundamentalists were so dead against. Uh, you know, these kids only know these parents and they're fine doing, they're healthy, they're in school, they're happy, they're, you know, it's terrific. So I, I don't think that gender has anything to do with it. I, I spent many years, 10, 12 years living in, in northern British Columbia uh, in an Indian village. Um, and uh, very modern and, and you know, uh, working and fishing and logging very people, but uh, in, in a small village, 300, 400 people. And uh, there I discovered that uh, the people I thought were the parents of some of my children's friends or kids I knew weren't the parents. Uh, you know, the parents lived two houses over. They were being raised by their aunt or somebody, or their grandmother, and had been that way ever since birth or later on. And they're lovely, happy kids, and they get along with everybody. Uh, I don't think it matters who raises you. Whoever raises you, as long as they love you and uh, have your best interests at heart, you can't ask for better than that. And they can only be average people, good enough parents. This idea that, that somebody's got to be a perfect parent is total bullshit. As long as you're a good enough parent, the children are lucky. That's great. That's I, have a, <laughs> I have a, one one small specific questions from the from the audience. Uh, some oh. some guys are considering uh, seriously considering Canada as a, as a way to immigrate. So the question is re regarding the prenuptial agreements. Do they yes. uh, do they get you any? Uh, do they guarantee you anything? Because in Russia it can be discarded very easily. Does it guarantee you uh, economical things and uh, uh, things about children in case of divorce? Well, it, it's, it's a complicated area. There's very little guarantees, but they are helpful. If you enter into a prenuptial agreement, uh, the courts and then later on uh, you fall apart. The, the, as long as there has been legal advice given to both parent, both parties before the marriage, that's the requirement. And then five years later or 10 years later, it all falls apart. The courts step in and they ask two questions. And this is the killer. They ask, was it reasonable and fair at the time it was made? And the second question is, is it reasonable and fair now to enforce it? Uh, and that second question is uh, is a gamble. Uh, you, 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 you get married and the agreement is that you're both going to keep the money that you bring in. Okay, one of, the, one of the spouses invests their money and makes millions of dollars. Uh, and then at 10 years later, when they separate, the separate the marriage agreement says that the spouse with the millions of dollars keeps it. Is that fair for the other person? And, and this goes back to gender issues and our and society's uh, inherent, almost it's in the DNA, 
protection of the mother. Uh, and this is one of the problems. And, and uh, we always want to protect the mother. If, if two businessmen entered into a similar agreement, and 10 years later, the, their business, whatever it was, fell apart, one of them can't go in and say, oh, it's unfair. They'll say, forget that. It's unfair, but, but you agreed to it. And, you know, there's a lot of masculine argument that that should be the way it stays. Um, uh, the, um, I just because you, I can tell you, I'm interested in the whole uh, societal change in the roles of fathers that is occurring and the roles of mothers, not only with the both parents now working, and, but both parents parenting. And uh, I, I haven't researched this or looked at it. Maybe one of your people can think about it. But there are articles coming out now about how cell phones uh, are, our dependence upon video and cell phone and all this are affecting uh, the neuroplasticity of the brain. They're affecting the way our nerve and our brain uh, interprets the world and this and that. Uh, and is this going to be genetically passed down? And so my, my sort of question of the day is, will the change, I mean, it was, it was always the case that the male was the hunter-gatherer and the mother stayed in the cave and raised the child. Uh, and that's for millions of years. Now, can that change, can, can there be an evolutionary change eventually caused by the fact that that paradigm no longer exists? Uh, uh, would that evolutionary change occur only in, I suppose, in societies where the paradigm doesn't exist, where the paradigm still exists, maybe in, uh, you know, what we call uh, the, uh, in the, some of the, in Borneo or in Africa or uh, the Indians in Brazil, I mean, I'm being corny, but th that's interesting because I, I do know that fathers, one of the big problems fathers have is not knowing what the hell is their role in, in modern society. That's true, yeah. Well, well, it, it it has been a really really interesting and deep and profound uh, one and a half hours. I anytime. thank you, thank any, you very much. Yeah. Any 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 time you want to do it, I mean, uh, Sergey, Sergey, right? Yes. Good. Well, Sergey, thank you very much for the opportunity, and and uh, uh, Nazarovia. <laughs> Thank you very much. I hope we will get back to these themes and uh, yeah, we will do a follow up. Sure, absolutely. It's easy. This is my first experience with Skype. I had to download it yesterday. I was afraid it wouldn't work. <laughs> yeah, the, the same for me, mostly. Yeah. It's excellent. Well, you, you're, you're a good interviewer. Stay at it. Okay. Thank you. I will try. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks.